Premiere set. There you go. And marker. Have a seat, grab some popcorn and a drink, make yourself comfortable. Although you probably won't be staying that way for long because it's Insanity Works Incorporated Movie Night. I'm Luke Lynch, host for The Legion, and I welcome you to the Watch Along. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to a very special watch-along hosted by yours truly. I am, of course, Luke Lynch, Commander of the Legion. And usually we are known for doing wrestling watch-alongs. This time, we actually have a film, a legit film, on tap today. And it is a classic from way back in the day. Tonight's presentation is La Strada, which is Italian for The Road, if I remember correctly from 1954, directed by Federico Fellini and starring Anthony Quinn in the lead role. With me tonight is the Lionheart, Mike Nikos. Nikos, how you doing, man? I'm doing spectacular. How are you, Casey? I'm doing good. Um, there may or may not be some others coming along. Uh, they will If so, they will obviously have full leave to join as they so wish. Um, so, we both have something of a history with this movie and uh we can talk about that really quick before we get started here but first let's go to uh let's go to the greek here because you actually studied this film as part of your schooling did you not i did so uh during my last semester or at least the semester before the previous um at UMass Boston, uh, I was taking up a cinema studies course, you know, just as a minor degree in order to fully graduate. So the subject was called Italian cinema. And I figured, well, as a youth, I watched a lot of Greek cinema, which was mainly just black and white comedies. But I never fully explored, like, any other cinema aside from Greek. So I decided to take up, like, a different opportunity of, of seeing movies through different languages and the first one was that was the only one available was the Italian cinema course I would have chosen other courses but they were just you know testing out the cinema studies program at the university because it was so recent so I said eh why not and there was a bunch of movies that we were watching the way that this class would work is it's once a week for four hours the first two hours is some students or the teacher would give a lecture on the movie of what we're watching and then students would present their movie on what they would choose from the list and talk about and the rest of the two or three hours depending on class time we watch the next movie that is available on the curriculum so this movie popped up in the curriculum and I gotta say, when I first watched this movie, I, I felt disheartened, and I, I, I felt very, like, pitiful towards the end of this movie. Of course, I'm not gonna spoil anything, but it, it felt unsatisfied of how everything would play out, and of course, that during the time, that was, like, my first viewing, so I'm hoping to look back into it uh, in a second viewing, and for the first time with a another person's pair of eyes which is why we're joining well we're to together on this one um so mr gallagher what would you say got you into watching or recommending this film for us tonight so those of you who don't already know i am a subscriber to the youtube channel nightmind 
And in 2019, he did a three-part exploration series on the book House of Leaves. A book that you actually gave me last night because I was just so fascinated with how this is a book that's supposed to be meant to read in different styles and abstractions that completely tears down the traditional forms of reading a book. Yes, and one of the ways in which you can read that book is especially as far as the, uh, not so much the story within the story, but the framing device of the story within the story, if you know, you know, uh, is as an echo of the plot of this movie. Hmm. So... I've been wanting to watch it for a while now, and I just never got around to doing it. Now I actually have an excuse to. And I have a film student with me, a minor film student, but a film student nonetheless, uh, to talk me through, to help talk me through some of the stuff that might have been going through uh, the filmmaker's mind. Because you can tell a lot about, uh, I don't know much about film study, but I, I pretty sh I'm a pretty strong believer in that you can tell a lot about a film and the people that made it by the way it was shot. I'm sorry, could you ask me the question again, Casey? Right. So, I don't know about you, but I'm a big believer in the concept of being able to tell a lot about the people that made a movie by the way the movie was shot. Oh, yeah, and the one thing in the um, film course that I took that is that each film has a variety of different directors, so we kind of take a look at what is called the author's signature, where it's mainly how the director kind of places a part of himself or his style of technique into the movies that they're making. Like, for example... Um, Akira Kurosawa, for instance. Yeah. His aspect, or his author's signature, is he would do these these takes where everything and anything is, like, in the frame, where he doesn't blur out anything in the background, where we kind of get the whole story from the background and in the foreground as well. And that's been some... That's been, like, a technique that most directors in the modern day even use, where... There's also including of the fast cuts and usually the medium, but mainly it's kind of like a style that they kind of generate throughout more and more through the generations. Yeah. And we are going to explore a very early pioneer of a lot of this, especially in terms of narrative in filmmaking. Now, in terms of filmmaking, um, for long term, like, this film was made in, like, the 1950s, so it, they've made some progress of how film directing was, oh, like, revolutionized in the 1920s. Oh, they've made a lot of progress on that front. Oh, bunch of progress. But they were at this moment, like, after World War II, where now that the film industry was slowly resurfacing in, like, some kind of, like, renaissance after what had happened to like films even before and during World War II. Yep. But these are the types of movies, like especially in the 50s, where they, the film industry, and not just in uh, Italy, but all across like the world, they were just revolutionized and pioneering like different techniques of camera style, uh, frame by frame shots, and uh, like other stylistic forms of like character development. Which we can see in this movie, where this this movie kind of takes the whole character form of innocence and shows you that it'll destroy like any sense of morality because, like, if you take a look at American movies like during 1950s, they usually have like a simple story of like, for instance, a guy meets girl, guy gets to know girl, guy marries girl, happy ending. But in films all across the world, they take stories and they deconstruct the whole traditional value of 
life sucks. So here's a representation of what it's like. Yeah. And that's and that's mainly what like the whole formula is for like leading up into the 1950s into the 60s, where they try to tear down the traditional values of like how movies are supposed to interpret it as something for like families and entertainment where it's more now a lot of actors are using or experimenting with the techniques of how do we show the people that who go into the movie theater to escape from reality how can we make them say no matter where you go reality will catch up with you yeah and I feel like this movie is why it's considered like a fan favorites, which I, I'll, I'll explain more about it. But I, I feel like I'm going to leave a majority of it to the movie we're watching. And another announcement that I feel like we should uh, make is if you'd like to hear a more in-depth movie review, it will be available on Owen's channel. We are finally going to be upstarting the retro movie reviews at some point, hopefully by next week. So our plan is we watch the movies first on this watch along on Casey's channel. Yep. Then we do the reviews on Owen's channel. And we this will not be the first movie, but there will be a lot more that we can unravel into the whole world of cinema. And based from this book that I have that has La Strada in it, let me just tell you, it may be listed as a hundred fan favorite movies, but I'm sure we'll hit even a lot more. Because there's a lot of movies out there that are just so criminally underrated that apparently this book couldn't fit into these 100 picks. Hmm. And and there's a lot of good stuff here. Uh, there's, oh, absolutely. There's a lot of good stuff here that we're going to be uh, watching over the coming uh, over the coming weeks and months. So let's not waste any more time, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Children of all ages, we give you The Road, a.k.a. La Strada, by Federico Fellini, 1954. Three, two, one, speed, action. marker, and action. Action. Dino De Laurentiis. Why do I know that name from somewhere? I think it's probably an older... F y you know what? Hang on. Let me just take a look at the book right here. Uh, I think it's like Italy's version of the the Metro Golden... Um, Golden Mayan. Oh, Metro, Metro, Metro Gold, yeah. Metro Goldwyn Mayer, MGM. Yeah, yeah. I think that's it, it, it's ha it, like Italy's version of it. <laughs> uh, if you want, case you can put it on full screen if you like. Mm. Wait for it. There we go. You can still see that, right? Mm -hmm. Alright, good. Another key actress that you're also going to be paying attention to is um, <clears throat> Giletta Massina, who plays as the character of Jelsomina. Jo yep, Jelsomina. She, during the time in Italy, she was like the biggest like actress in Italy. Yeah. Because during the time... In Italy, I think, it is the birthplace of the so-called movie stars. Mm. Somebody calling for Jocelyn I There he is. 
Zapano. Yeah. So immediately most people would think that, oh, she's selling off her daughter, like, as, like, a laborer or worker, but... Believe it or not, this was actually pretty common back in the day, if I'm not much mistaken. This was basically, like, a grand adventure to step into the outside to, like, make your own way. Right. So it wasn't necessarily, like, you're being sold as a laborer or as a slave, but rather it's your opportunity to have skills... Yeah, and see the world. A simple expansion of the chest muscles. I'll blow up the hook. This is one of the classic. Um, this is one of the classic things that actually uh, House of Leaves actually talks about. Uh, somebody. Uh, yeah, here it is. Once in Milan, a two hundred a two hundred some odd pound man lost his eyesight when he tried doing what Zampano's about to do. The ocular nerve has to do all the work, and when you once you're blind, it's all over. Mm -hmm. He's constantly he's constantly hyping up the chain. Never talks about how weak the hook might be. And of course, people of the circus never reveal their tricks. And I, and e even if they know it's bull, you're entertaining them. So. Oh, That would not go over well if Zampano saw that. 
Yeah, sorry. If you, you keep seeing me like enter in and out, uh, I'm just trying to get my internet connection back on. Yeah, fair enough. So, in case I don't know on my end, it says that the stream is paused. Says we're good on my side. Yeah, back out for a second. Hold on, ladies and gentlemen. There's a technical minor difficulties. She'll get there. Alright, let me just do this on my end. I definitely think it's on your end. Oh, hey! Kuzon's here, what's going on, bro? I was here at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it says on my end that the stream is paused. No, I think, I think it's on... the provider's end. Over Casey? Yeah. Because uh, I wanna... can't see it, because it says stream pause. Yeah, Casey, uh, you wanna... What you can do, hmm? is you can stop the... You can stop the stream um, off Discord, and then display it again. Yes. Yeah. Uh, swap to your application to resume. Is oh, you can try it. Yeah, you can try that. You can swap to a different application and then swap back to uh, the original. Yeah. yeah, hold on a sec. So, I'm gonna do... So, what I'm gonna do, I'm just closing a few things, saving up on RAM. Do -do 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 -do. Okay, so now we got all those closed. Did you pause the stream earlier when you were um, talking about a uh, Zampano's trick or something? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Uh, hang on a sec. All right, share my screen. Let's try that.
Alright, I don't know if you boys can see anything, but, uh... You released here things? All right, let's try this again. We took a wrong turn on uh, on La Strada, as it were. <laughs> All right, so let's back up a few minutes. Yep. You guys can see everything, right? Yep. I'm just gonna switch over to my phone. All right. Yeah. Because uh, we'll leave uh, to go see the fireworks in a few seconds, and I'll just have my phone with me while uh, we're watching. Okay. Cool.
All right. I can see. What the hell? I can see. Here. <laughs> so, Jack, have you ever seen this movie before? No, when did this movie come out? This came out in 54. Also, having a movie come out in 54 and it being, like, a film that isn't in English, it's, it's kind of hard to track that down when you're younger. Yeah. Well, to be fair, a lot of movies, like, weren't, like, released in the United States. Like, I know that uh, during this time, Akira Kurosawa made um, Seven Samurai. And a lot of people consider it, like, a national phenomenon. This was released in 55 in November in the UK. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Oh, big chest. Sorry, what? Chest. Yeah, the one man circus was kind of like this. Yeah. A really boring show. Especially by like, today's standards. Where's the pro wrestling? <laughs> oh, if there was pro wrestling in for the circus, it would have been stiff. I mean, like, pro wrestling was a carnival, um, act, like a carnival. A carnival thing? marvel? Yeah. Yeah. Like an attraction? I think it was that way all the way up until, like, probably Blackpool, England, like, were the last ones to do it that way. I get very uh, shoujo subaki um, reference, it, like a vibe from this. Oh, they all took uh, like inspiration from like these movies. Like the fifties, in my opinion, was probably like an uprising in the cinema industry. Mm. Like, I'm looking at the book, and for the 50s era, there's just so, like, a lot of movies that kind of trumps every other movie that was made in different decades. Like, the 50s was, like, at least two or three, like, columns mm -hmm. of movies. Like, damn. Shame that the same thing couldn't be said about the 80s or the mm. 90s. Yeah, right. Because there's a lot of good ones there, too. But we'll come to we'll we'll cross that bridge when we see to it. Yep. You see what I mean by like the like stereo audio that they edit in in post. Mm -hmm. I don't think it was edited in post. I think it was just like. The way they had the, the way they echoed off the off the uh, mic. Well, like, so audio technician back then to get like surround sound or like at least dynamic audio. Back then, uh, headphones used to have like two knobs on each ear cup to be able to differentiate um, instruments. So you would have drums being recorded in the right ear 
and the guitar and vocals and the left ear, you know? That makes sense. That That's how they got around, like, stereo audio back then. I'm wondering if that's what they did with, um, like, movies at this time. Wouldn't I know that sound... Sorry for cutting you off, but um, sound wasn't implemented in cinema until the 1930s came along. Yeah, by that... Music was around, though. Music was around, but they didn't have, like, glass breaking and feet feet crunching through snow and whatnot until, like, the 30s came around. And by which time Charlie Chaplin, I believe, had already had most of the high point of his career. Well, I'm more talking about, like, music as in, like, records Ah. um, and, like, headphone use. Of course, like, getting good headphones back then and getting the production for that uh, to have home use, very expensive. But it's definitely needed to obviously edit a film. So that's, like, the equipment that they will be using at the time. Mm. Also, how do you like the... um, long pipe with the little cigarette in the end. That is so 50s. Mm. I'm flashing back to 101 Dalmatians. So, Fucking uh, Corilla de Ville. She chew on tobacco. Yeah. Seeing you here makes me hope for a nuclear winter. Damn, she was coughing on that smoke. <laughs> Not gonna lie, Zampano like reminds me of a family friend. Like just how he looks and acts. Uh let's not open that can of worms. <laughs> At least not live on air. Go watch the fireworks. Speaking of which, if any of you who are watching this uh, tomorrow, happy Fourth of July! Yes. No comment. That's what you get for taxing the shit out of us. I was born in 1998, <laughs> and I was born 97. In case it was one before all of us. Yeah, I'm the old I'm man. Few. I'm the old man here. I had a feud of my, and <laughs> my wife in a feud, one time, and I ain't got no wife no more. <laughs> I like how you tell them, oh, it's American made. It's an instant turn on. Well, America, like back at this point. Um, just leave her alone. Yeah, this movie's pretty heavy. Yep, like I said previously, or in the other stream. Um, oh. that dude back there—that was like a like a backdrop, right? And like the only reason I remember, the only reason I recognize that is because like I'm pretty sure that's supposed to be like an art piece or like a reference to an art piece. A lot of the transitional backgrounds tangly like to use the like artistry of the backdrop. Mm. Yeah. That's what makes so, it So sort of like sort of like uh, you see where the lights coming off through the alleyway. That yeah. almost looks like that could be a backdrop. I have to say they definitely did um, the lighting really well. Mm. And then you see like a big like dirty shadow in the behind her. <laughs> Even the quotes that they use in this movie, like "ingratitude is the world's wage," like you wouldn't normally hear that in any other like American cinema, for instance. Yeah. Because American cinema, they were still under the Axe Law, where the main actor, actress, had to be, you know, pretty, handsome, clean-shaven, no swearing. Yep. We're in this... No swearing, no swearing. Whereas in 
cinema in the other countries, like Europe and Asia, there was no wax law, so they could just do whatever. Germany got away with a lot, surprisingly, and now you look at Germany, it's like, no, you're not allowed anything in, in any media. It's like, huh? With Germany, they were more into the artistic form called expressionism, which they carried out into and even after World War II, which kind of like provided an artsy fartsy form of They're cinema. Not a fan of uh, dead talk in like well, real conversations or cinema. Dead talk referring to like small talk. Yeah. Which is probably like, where on, like, that comes from. Like later on, we'll be watching some movies from Fritz Lang, which I can. Which, you'll see what I mean with expressionist movements where the backdrops and the characters like in non-dialogue speak the the story better than the actual dialogue mm -hmm. I have Moment, to say the camera moments like, very moments, good. moments like this here to your point Nikos hey how's it going I'm burning too. of course there's more to, to there's more to to talk about when the uh, retro series co comes out on Owen's channel. Yeah. So be on the look for that. Yes, indeed. And Owen, if, if you're watching this, if it'll help you, I will take notes on this. So rest assured, you'll be safe. Glad somebody is. <laughs> yeah, because as far as I'm concerned, I don't know what this film is. I don't know what we're watching. Well, to be fair, I'm also using uh, the chapter in the book that I have, which details, like, the points of the movies in general. But I'm just taking a couple of notes of what's important to see and yeah, to talk about. Yes. Yeah. Watch it get tangled up in the barbed wire. You know that, uh... Oh, big sleepy. Big tail. Big sneeze. I think he sneezed himself awake. Has that ever happened to any of y'all? You just sneeze yourself awake? I don't think it's a thing that's real. Yeah, what's with the uh, Raider logo? Uh, you talking about the thing on the side of the cart? Yeah. Uh, I think that the, uh, his calling card probably, or maybe he actually stole it from the Raiders. Macho man would be proud. <laughs> yeah? Oh, no way you would have, like... No, you would not have, like, slowed down for him. All those sheep would have been obliterated. It would have been obliterated, bro. It was also random, too. Like, why we cut to the sheep? To show the weird. They're just yeah. being run over. Sheeple, you know? The sheeple. My people.
Is this the world's first mocap suit? Made in the 50s, maybe. Yeah, all it is is bells. That spiked. And she was smart enough to give him the drink. Mm. Oh, Babushka! <laughs> this is Baba. I would have said Babish. Did you go Babish? Uh, did you really need to scare the shit out of that dog? No oh, this, dude, this was in the 50s. They didn't give a shit about the animal safety program. We're gonna rob you, lady. I'm gonna that take your hat, bro. You know what? That was common. Well, that's what I think of when, like, during this age. Uh, I think Red Dead has done that to me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. The, the, the child pickpocketers when you go to yeah, Sandy. Yeah. Yeah. Blake. Blake. Oh, he's got a bad mm -hmm. case of lumbago. D&D was crazy back then. Did we find the did we find Owen's ancestor in the chair? Jesus. <laughs> Yo. Yo, hold up. Did did this nun pull up a sword? That's a staff, it looked like. Okay, because I thought it was a sword. Like, Jesus. You should take that stick from her and just, like, take her out. Stick like, sister? That's why I... I'm not gonna lie, that suit looks good. Yo, is he standing up like a horse? Why? Good streak. Can we, can we go for three? You got married twice, and you're still she got, poor? She got married twice, and... I mean... What was she there to do, mainly? How are you poor? You. Oh, it's the same plate you were just eating from. That's... That's disgusting. Mm -hmm. Alright. Actually, to be honest, I wouldn't mind. If I'm, like, really that hungry, sure, why not? Yeah, right. They don't They don't make a lot of money performing, usually, so they end up taking clothing or food as compensation. Oh. The, uh... You know... Goblin... 2? Like... Association? Whoa. Those eyes. She... She just had a realization of some kind. See forever. Like she has, like the most notable thing of this movie is Jelosima's like facial expression because she's supposed to be portrayed as like a young woman, yet she has the fascination of a child. So she's always just very perceptive and observant. And she looks forty. Yeah. 
Like, she's always looking around. She's either, like, very traumatic, very sad, or just very observant to the sights around her, because she doesn't know where she is. She's learning new things in the world. Mm -hmm. She's experimenting. Also, uh, was that car a Rolls Royce? Was Rolls Royce even around back then? Definitely. But in Italy, though, that's... So Rolls Royce, I believe was first created uh, at least like the foundation of it was created in um cheshire east of uh england which is like the northwest area interesting yeah and then they got bought out i mean there is a chance that they might have like manufactured some here or they brought over from the united oh, states yeah, they over just definitely so... expanded yeah Like, five years after the war could change a lot. Actually, no, not five years. This is, I think, six years. No, not six. Nine years, excuse me. How do you feel about the um, tilted fedora? Makes him look like a Don or a Capo. A huge yeah. Italian stereotype. I'll give her a double, double axe handle. That's terrifying, her looking up at him, by the way. That's really scary. That's... That's, like, symbolism of how, like, relationships with a macho, like, ego is involved. Yeah. So, again, with no dialogue, you can pretty much understand this movie just from how they express their movements and facial features. I have to say, she, say she's a very good actor. Um, oh, she was a star in Italy. Oh, I can imagine. Like, this was not, like, the first movie she's been in. She's been in, like, a whole other tropes of movies. Not feeling this guy's character. Give it time. You'll come around. And then you realize, oh crap, I have no idea where home is from here. Like, where could she go? She just takes them. <laughs> she just learns how to drive all of a sudden. He walks down the path like five minutes. She finds it parked like in a ditch. Oh, that road is greasy. Ooh. Probably just rains. Yeah. Ants out of an ant hole? Maybe she's playing with leaves? Uh, House of Leaves, if you could say? <laughs> ah, the troubadours. Not to be that guy, but that's a path like right there. <laughs> See, they've they've seen the script notes for Star Wars: Revenge of the Sith. They have oh, the high <laughs> <laughs> this, this British guy has no culture. <laughs> Ooh. 
life of Brian? Some things in life are bad. I can really make you <laughs> mad. <laughs> hear ye, hear ye. Oh, Catholicism. Not so much a religion, and yet Aaliyah's a birthright. <gasps> Piggy. Damn, he's gonna show a pig? Like that? Miss Piggy! Piggy. What? Thought that was gonna be Zampano for a second. Yeah, why y'all pulling people around? Like, get off me. Madonna Immaculata. Could it be that she wants to be perceived as a Madonna? Again, this was probably like the first film like I was introduced to into the Italian cinema course class. So the minute I saw Madonna appear, I, I thought to myself, Madonna, her music wasn't made yet. <laughs> Bar. <laughs> bar. Casey, what bar is this? Well, it's mostly black and white. So I'd say it's a hoodsy cup. You Sabu looks weird. <laughs> you mean Sabu <laughs> You never get, like, the... Oh, you just fucked that guy's car up. There goes the Rolls Royce. You never get, like, the overhead crowd camera angle anymore, like, on top of a building. It's kind of frowned upon, like this. Like, few cinemas start using something, like, of the camera use like this. Sounds like the voice actor oh, from um, no, I yes, I Looney Tunes. Why wouldn't I? I mean, he sounds like Mel Blanc. Yeah, I, I kind of. Yeah, you know what I mean. I can kind of hear it. So, introducing the funniest character of the movie, Richard Basehart. Ah, the, the fool. Mato. If I'm not much mistaken, he is also known as the Fool. Yep. And, and here Mato he is. Italian for, so, fun fact Mato is Italian for loom. As in what you use to weave clothing? No, loon. Like. An idiot. Oh, oh, loon. L O O N. Okay, I'm like, what the hell? Now, at least a few, at least a couple of these people have at least relatively normal sounding names, even for outside of Italy. Uh, uh, especially Anthony Quinn, who plays as uh, Zampano. I wonder how many of these people are actually legit speaking Italian in the clips. Because it looks like at least a few of these lines were dubbed over. So, uh, there is an English dub of this movie where they actually had to use like the same actors because they are bilingual, like Anthony Quinn and Richard Basehart. As for... Jelsomina's uh, actress, I think they had to get another woman to do the English because, again, she was a top star in Italy and would only star in Italian movies, so there was no room for any of the English-speaking movies that they would air. Yeah.
But yeah, it boggles my mind that there are so that, that there were actors back then that were bilingual, who could literally just do the English in English and in their own language, like it's nothing. Mm. Nowadays, they oh, they, they, we have to have an English dub. Just get American actors. Um, I speaking would of American actor, I would disagree. The um the Netflix show Dark that mainly has German actors, but a lot of them can speak English. Didn't know that they had they had another show called uh, 1899 or 1989. Uh oh. They just like like rammed their head into the wall. To be fair, in a, in a sick, morbid sense, he's actually helping her. Yeah. I, I know it looks bad, but without him, where could she go? She doesn't know where she, home is. She doesn't have any money. She hasn't eaten. I mean, it's rough, but what can you do? Reminds me of... Uh, It's a place that's based in Sweden. Uh, hey, Jackass. The fact that you can ride them in Red Dead 2 is just funny. Yeah. Buongiorno. Buongiorno. What are you doing that dog? Buongiorno. I freaking hope not. Hey, look who it is. Ricky boy. That's a fucking is. flex right, right there. Yeah, Fuck it's the like a really like, right, uh, sexy like action. All the ladies today. Oh my god. I was gonna say, fuck this, the long cigarette holders. Put your cigarette on the end of a violin to serenade the ladies. Yeah. <laughs> the only time I can drink coffee, if it's like. Old fashioned made or just iced coffee? You do come across as someone who's quite snobby about their coffee. <laughs> so, like, um. As someone who's going to a Greece, trained barista. So, like, since I'm going to Greece, like, at the end of the month, um, there's this type of uh, style of coffee called Greek made coffee where. They literally just make the coffee out of like the metal tin over the fire, kind of like the old-fashioned way. Yeah, it's a uh, French press um, they use. It's like a form of French press, is it? Yeah. So you wouldn't necessarily use like the coffee grinder or even like, the coffee maker. You just pour in hot water, put the thing in, let it heat, and drink it like it's an espresso. That would taste really weak. If you add a little bit of sugar, it's actually fine. This is why I don't fucking cook! <laughs> this episode of The Watch Along is brought to you by Culinary Cooks. Walked headlong into the freaking tent. God, how much grease you need to put in your hair, dude? Oh my god, Sabu! 
Was it grease back then, or was it like uh, pomade? Uh, I think pomade was more American made, where they just had to use grease. Or like olive oil, I think. Yeah. Bro, he's he's really ribby gets at this dude. He didn't do anything. I feel like Zampano was like a blueprint to creating like Man of Steel. Mm. Actually, no, because Man of Steel was created like long before this movie was made. Yeah. I never noticed he has a snake tattoo on his arm. Oh, this is a backstage shoot right here. Yep. That's how we call it in the shoot business. They don't work themselves into a shoot. Like, when I first saw this, I'm like, dude, it's just a joke. Calm down. It's not like he actually exposed the business. Well, the one... All right, so that's part one. Yeah, that was part one. So, if you boys want, you could just take a, a break here before we start up part two. This is going to be our little intermission. So, what do you guys think so far? Uh, definitely an intriguing, uh, character study on the male ego. Oh, yeah, because these were the types of movies that they were mainly just fascinating on, like, the character ideal of, like, what being a, quote-unquote, macho man is in cinema. Yep. And, of course, the, even though Randy Savage kind of, kind of? like personifies the whole macho man aesthetic this is te this is technically like an idealist like what they would actually look like like the whole macho identity just kind of comes off as like th this was a natural way or like what the whole male ideal was for men during like this time because they, again they're just coming out of the world war and mainly it was like a difficult time for having to adjust to certain circumstances in life where men who were just coming after the war, even after they 
what came home. L- life was bitter, and yet they greeted it bitterly. So they were never had to open up any of their hearts to any of the struggles of life. So they just kind of had to keep close to them. Yep. So Zampano just kind of personifies everything that's wrong with life that he never wants to open up. He never wants to like have a genuine conversation or heart to heart with Jesselmina and how he takes his frustrations out on Mato because Mato kind of represents, you know, the, the, the humorous funny side of life that Zampano just wants to squash because life's not, life is not just a game. There's some shit there that, you know, kind of makes men crazy. Mm. And it got to, and we can pretty clearly see it got to Zampano ages ago. Oh, definitely. Jack, right. what do you think? Buff? Mm, no. Oh, there you are. Any concerns, Jack? Oh. Um, no, no complaints. I do have to say, though, like, uh, without context to, like, why the film is so good, I am quite lost. <laughs> the, uh,. The... I'm sure at the time this was killer. Like, there was oh. nothing out like it. Oh, dude. Um, it's it's more so that... It's less intended to be seen as... A stand... Like a... Uh, I don't want to say a bog standard film, but I think you get the idea. And more an examination on... What the pressures of life can do to so somebody's it's heart. So connect with the audience on an emotional level. Yes. Because the Italian cinema during this time, they didn't bother creating, like, movies for story purposes. Like, it, 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 they could have made anything that would generate a quick buck. But they decided to choose something that's real. Real situations with real people with real problems. Yeah. Because that in a circus. The whole, yeah, and the cold hard truth about it is that the basis in which we'll, we can talk about in the retro in full length. But the main point of it this is, is life sucks, and you can't go into it with being a naive fool. And in this case, Zapato creates like an interesting uh, character study of why innocence can actually be the death of you. So you would have to resort being like the cold hard bastard that you have to be in order to strive in this world that's unforgiving. But in any case, especially back then. Let's continue with part two. You ready, boys? Lights, camera, action.
Maybe that's what she needed, a little encouragement. Yeah. I like how they don't use animals at all for their circus. Yeah. Because even they, because even even the Italians realize, yeah, using animals as part of our circus is kind of fucking wrong. Oh, speak of the devil. Straight to the cops.
Wow. An artichoke. Way to be a dick, dude. And his entire excuse is, I just want to punch him in the face. Big tears. She's got the face for it, though. Oh, definitely. I think the sad cloud.
Not gonna lie, I thought he was walking with a limp for a second. Anybody, anybody catch that melody in the background? Thought I was here in Hall of the Mountain King for a sec. You won't have to hear that until Fritz Lang's movie in the 30s. Walmart and I get in line and the two people in front of me are raging fucking cunts. Oh, 
hollering at the poor people, the poor three guys at the one self-checkout that takes cash, which is giving them a hard time. And they're, I don't know what's wrong with these guys, take four to five fucking minutes, people say, as I walked out, I went, well, why don't you go to a cashier if you gotta pay cash? Stop bothering them. Oh, God, him and her just running their mouth like Karen. The three bean salad that I'm making for fucking the cookout tomorrow. Oh, sorry.
And I'm going to bring Patience's bowls to Saturday. I still have one of her Rubbermaid containers that I forgot had muffins in the freezer. I actually have the muffins I brought home for Casey. He forgot all about them, so. He's eating them. Except we need the chocolate ones. The chocolate ones work. They were like chocolate strawberry ones. Does that tell you how long ago it's been since they've been in this? No, I don't think, she made them for me. Remember, I, I posted that thing about Pop Casey's. Yeah, some people, I brought a whole bunch of stuff to her. I just, um, I don't want to forget to give it back to her, you know? Here comes the big turning point of this movie that I've heard about. the shot.
what a bastard. Yeah. Well, if I keep coming in and out, uh, I apologize. Uh, the connection I have here isn't really that great. But I'm really walking to the fireworks. Yeah. We, we get it. It's all good. Yeah. Besides, so we're almost done here anyway. There's like not even 20 minutes left. Hey, tell your friends I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. Also, mom sends her apologies for all the rage. Nah, that's good. That's some trauma right there. Doesn't take much, but you know from a, but you know from that little bit, he never meant to kill the guy. At least not on that particular occasion.
Off a bowl for tomorrow, take to work. Yeah, you just saw that. He left her.
Uh, they, supposed, they, they were supposed to be for Keto. Oh, honey, shame on you. They've been here too long. They've been. I mean, you eat them if you want. She's never gonna. She's not. She probably forgot all about them. She's so busy right now. She's been working mad hours at work since she's not in school. And that's the song he taught Jelsamina.
going to the shop and get back there. Of course, that's the same beach he left Jasmina at. Well, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, this has been La Strada. Oh, holy buckets, y'all. Nikos wasn't kidding. That film is heavy. Unfortunately, the man himself is muted at the moment. Uh, Jack, your thoughts? If you're even still awake. I think, uh, I think Nikos might have got butt, uh, butt disconnected and, uh, took himself out of the call. Um, but yeah, man, that was, whew, that was a real heavy film. And, uh, I don't know if, I don't know if uh, you're still at the desk, but if um, if you can hear me, if you're still around, the uh, the major piece of context that drew me uh, to want to watch this film uh, comes from uh, essays and criticism by Federico Fellini, the director of La Strada. Uh, edited by Peter Bondanella. Uh, 
on page 57, I believe, of that book. He says, in reference to La Strada, uh, but the filmmaker's own comments suggest that enlightenment and self-discovery will lead to change. As Emile G. McAmany and Robert Williams observe, the cry of Zampano as he claws the sand at the end of the film is not that of a wounded beast, but the anguish of a human being in his birth pangs. What Zampano has done to Gelsomina can be described as tragic, for no amount of tears will ever bring back the love that she once offered him, and which he blindly trampled beneath his feet. Nonetheless, Gelsomina's sacrifice, as Fellini puts it, eventually becomes the means of Zampano's redemption. For man is useless and lonely before eternity, only if he does not know how to love everyone and everything in the universe. Such is the meaning of Gelsomina's life and death, and such is the lesson Zampano has begun to grasp at that final moment that Aristotle called the anag the anagnorisis? I'm probably... I'm probably butchering that. So ma So majorly. Uh, of course, what helps to make Lestrada so unforgettable is that Fellini subjects not only Zampano, but also the viewer, to the same recognition. End quote. So, uh, yeah, that was, uh, that was definitely a heavy movie. There was a lot of, there was a lot of stuff in there that, that I was like, ooh, they would not be able to do this today. Anybody else got anything they want to say? Mm, four out of ten, you know. <laughs> no, for the time being, like, um, so like what it is and what it was and what would come out after it. Again, like, I've, I've not watched this before, so, like, a, I guess, like, my view was, like, a lot more skewed than everyone else's. To be fair, I, this is my first time actually watching it through start to finish as well. I've only had, I've only had a synopsis up until now. Mm. So, you're in overall pretty good company here. Well, it's like cinema like at this time. It was like it was going in the direction of um, not just like entertainment, but like also like education and education that, in many ways, you just couldn't get anywhere else. Mm -hmm. So big, uh, big themes this film tackled. Um, world travel, abandonment, the death of innocence. It's, like Nico said, it's a heavy movie. Yeah. Probably not one on the, I'd watch on the regular, but I'm actually very glad I was able to watch it through. And, and, uh, big, big, big thank you for, uh, for joining me. I know it's like, almost quarter past two in the morning where you are big thanks for big thanks for soldiering out with us uh, I would probably say I'd probably say that's gonna be 
pretty close to a wrap for us, so you can probably head off and get some sleep. Uh, but mm. yeah, but big thanks again for joining us, and we will see you. Uh, you personally will see tomorrow, not tomorrow, uh, Friday, for coverage and preview of the G1 climax. So looking oh. forward. So contrast. <laughs> yes, quite the contrast. Uh, but yeah, for uh, for the Fire Lord Kuzon, uh, I'm Luke Lynch, Commander of the Legion, signing off for the watch along and for For the Win Productions. We'll see you on Friday, and maybe even Wednesday for an indie. We'll see how it goes. And cut.